in the programs, and um, and it didn't work out for him. He passed away, unfortunately. It's been a problem that I've been having hand raising pups. We don't know what their history is. We don't. There's a lot of problems with big brown bat colonies now. A lot of pup mortality. A lot of bat pups are dying, and uh, the state's trying to figure out why. And I think it's probably linked to white nose syndrome, but they're not sure. Um, our colony of big brown bats at White Memorial, where I work in Litchfield, in 2010 had, uh, we had 310 big brown bats in our colony, and this year, 167. And those bats aren't going somewhere else, those bats are dying, uh, they're territorial. So there's definitely something going on. So whenever I get abandoned pups or orphan pups, I just assume that um, they're going to die eventually. And her buddy that came from the bat house that she came from, um, he just passed away a couple of weeks ago. And there's no no reason for it. They're healthy, they're beautiful, I'm using them for programs, and then one day you walk into the room and they'll be gone. Are they sociable so that she misses him? No, they're not. They're not. Anything that expends energy a bat's not interested in doing. They're super lazy animals. <laughs> <laughs> they're really like, they don't play. So they play. <laughs> they don't play. Bats don't play. Um, they, they've got one thing in mind, and it's eating. Their job on this planet, especially the bats that we have here in Connecticut that eat nothing but insects, their job. Um, are, is, to, is to prey on insects. And because they're such a special mammal, um, anything else uh, in their world is going to expend energy. And the name of the game for them is gaining a big fat layer between around the 1st of April to just about now so that they can sleep all winter long. These bats are one of the only, one of three true hibernators that we have in our state. Everybody thinks that all mammals, or most mammals, hibernate, but they really don't. They'll go into torpor, a kind of a deep sleep. So the three hibernating species that we have in our state are the bat, the, um, uh, the woodchuck, and um, it's a species of mouse, and I can never remember what species it is. So there are only three true hibernating mammals in our state, and the bat's one of them. So everything this animal does in the summer is geared at eating to survive for the winter. So that's, you know, that makes them just such a benign creature. They just don't care about anything other than food. It's another reason I love them so much. So. <laughs> Are we starting? <laughs> well, that's really good. That's really good. All right. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm sure you're excited about this. I've been waiting for seven months. So, you know, I'm very really excited. <laughs> You've already heard from Jerry. Jerry, as she mentioned, she's the Director of Administration at White Memorial Conservation Center, which is up in Litchfield. It's wonderful. Go see it. Um, and she's also a DEP licensed um, rehabilitator, and she specializes in bats and parking pads and all kinds of interesting things. So um, we're really excited to have her back. She's going to talk to us about bats, and I'll give you a little quickie thing from her on that. Um, bats have occupied our planet for 50 million years, yet we have only seriously studied them over the last six decades. She's going to talk to us a lot about biology, ecology, their sonar, the cultural highs and lows, and why they are so important. And because they eat insects, I love them. So, good to you, Jerry. Thanks, <laughs> so thanks again for having me. It's always nice, Christopher, to see you. And I've been coming to this uh, nature center for many, many years now, so it's always fun to to uh, return. Um, I've been working with bats this year, was my 20th anniversary. On June 25th, 1992, I found an orphan big brown bat in my backyard, and she changed my life. At the time, I was a professional chef. I'm a real career um, switcher. Uh, so um, at any point in my life, much to my husband's dismay, I'll decide I want to do something else with my life. So I was a professional chef. I, I didn't have any kind of biology background. I have a degree in art history from New York University. And um, so that didn't lay any claim for me to work with an animal or keep an animal like a bat. Uh, but there were so few people in the United States and so few people in the world handling bats at that time that they would have taken anybody with a pulse that was interested in these animals, I swear. <laughs> and I had just enough love for bats. Um, I grew up just loving them that I knew people to call who might be able to help me with this orphan bat pup. And um, the person I was primarily looking for was a woman, Susan Barnard, who was the chief herpetologist at Zoo Atlantis, who uh, is now retired. She lives in Florida, and she works um, exclusively on her work with bats, especially big brown bats like Baldini that I have here tonight. And I called Sue up at the zoo, and um, I told her my story, and she said, are you prepared to keep this animal for its 30 years of life? And I said, well, I have an African gray parrot. She goes, you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. You're <laughs> fine. And uh, I got a copy of her book. Um, at the time, it was the only book in the world published on raising bats in captivity. 
and she was my mentor, and she's my mentor to this day. And um, I started a, a whirlwind uh, tour of enlightenment that I, mean, I was, I thought that everybody loved bats as much as I did. But I was finding more and more as I kept on reading, and it was all self-taught, that this animal is persecuted right here in our backyards, and it's persecuted around the world for no reason other than the fact that we've only taken the last 60 years to study them. So I got really involved in that I started um, illegally lecturing with her because I knew that I had no credentials that would make me, um, the state of Connecticut would never look at me and say, well, she can keep a bat because you know she is an art history major and a chef. They would never going to do that. So I started just doing work with bats, going out and lecturing. And then when things started getting uh, in the press and uh, I was collecting hundreds and hundreds of letters from children, um, that's when I finally approached the state and asked permission to keep her, and they said no. <laughs> and then I gave them stacks and stacks. It was like that scene on Miracle 34th Street at the end of the stacks of uh, Santa letters. It was the children that saved me and saved my bath. Um, letters from children and their accolades and what they were getting out of my programs is what made the state realize that the work that I was doing was legitimate. And um, ever since then, it's been a love affair between myself and the Connecticut DEP. So thank you. Yeah, yeah I love the DEP. I mean, it's a great, it's a great agency. I mean, I had to do something a little bit reckless in order to, but I knew that I had to, and it worked out well. And it's because of children that I'm, I'm here today, really, uh, because children are the reason these animals are going to be happy and healthy in the future. Uh, we adults have never studied bats, and um, so kids now in classrooms are studying bats. And that's really good news. So what I'm doing is empowering a child with knowledge that is going to change and make a very big difference in the world. And also how cool for a kid to be able to tell an adult something they don't know. Uh, so it's just a, a great thing for bats, a great thing for me, and a super great thing for children. Um, so I'm going to give you just a basic survey about bats, and then I'm going to take uh, Miss Krabby Pants here out, and um, we will... Um, do some questions and answers, and feel free to just shout out any questions that you might have. Like Crabby. It's crabby. Mm -hmm. Definitely a crabby bat. Species of them, and they're broken up into two groups. On the left are the mega bats. Uh, they live in tropical areas. They're completely um, uh, an animal that eats completely a fruit diet. Uh, so you'll find them in Australia and in uh, parts, lots of parts of Asia and in Africa as well. Their large eyes take in a lot of light. Uh, and they see in color, and they have a great sense of smell. Uh, they see in color because they need to see really ripe fruit, and that's what they're eating. Uh, and then, those are pups, by the way, you can see the little nipples in the back that they're using um, to uh, feed them milk formula. And then on the right is a Honduran tent bat, and this is a micro bat. Bo um, Bozy, you know Bozy, I'm sorry, Baldini is a micro bat. All the bats that we have in Connecticut are micro bats. They have small eyes, they see in black and white, so no bats are blind and they also have a great sense of smell. Um, but at night, this animal does what the mega bat can't do. It can see at night with sonar, and that's what makes it very, very special. Micro bats can range from something as small as a penny to something as large as a two or three foot wingspan, like a mastiff bat from California. So they, they range in color sizes and in functions as well. 80% of all bat species worldwide eat insects. So they, they eat insects, and that's what makes them, for me, the most important animal on the planet. And life on Earth can't exist without the contributions that bats make just through insect eating alone. Uh, but the vampire bat is a micro bat, and there are bats that eat scorpions, and bats that eat um, oh, all sorts of things, frogs, bats that eat fish, bats that eat birds, bats that will eat other bats. Those are all micro bats, and then all the mega bats are fruit eaters. So we have eight species of micro bats in Connecticut, and we'll meet every single one of them. Um, almost every single one of these animals, except for the big brown bat, is extremely rare now. Extremely rare. And some of them even, one is federally endangered, and possibly another one will be federally endangered very soon. The big brown bat is what I have with me tonight. It's the bat that you will get in your house. Um, it is the bat that you would find in a bat house. It's a bat that you'll have in your barn. Uh, they're kind of goofy. Uh, in captivity, a very laid-back animal behaves like a Labrador retriever, um, and very intelligent. And they're moth eaters in the wild. So this is an animal that really loves moths. The bigger the animal, the bigger the prey. Uh, so you know he's he's a much larger bat than a little brown bat. And moths are the thing that he likes the most. Uh, and they eat a lot of moths, especially the moths that kill corn crops. So um, at, at night when the 
farmers asleep and the bluebirds asleep. Big brown bats are patrolling gardens and making them as healthy as they possibly can by eating lots and lots of moths. Uh, their um, lovely picture on the bottom uh, left because it shows and illustrates how beautifully uh, a bat's wing is constructed. A bat's wing is nothing more than a modified hand. A hand just like yours with five fingers. We'll see a skeleton coming up. Uh, big brown bat also is very common across the United States. Uh, little brown bats, they eat about 1,200 mosquitoes in an hour on a summer night. The very sad story about them is that their populations are being decimated by this white nose syndrome. Have you all heard of it? Um, unfortunately, in Connecticut, we have a hibernaculum, a place where bats sleep for the winter, called Mine Hill. It's still there, out in Roxbury. And there were 4,000 little brown bats living at Mine Hill, and all of them are dead today because of white nose syndrome. So if you take every one of those animals and figure in 1,200 mosquitoes in an hour that each of them ate on a summer night, um, this past year, I think it's only because I'm so in tune with the fact that these myota species, these really small species of bats that are all in, um, mosquito eaters in our state are all disappearing. Um, I keep on hearing about West Nile viruses here in the news. I've heard a couple of cases of equine encephalitis on the news, and I'm wondering about the public health implications of losing so many animals that are preying on mosquitoes. Um, Seven million bats, similar to the little brown bat, have died. What are equine viruses? Because White nose syndrome, we'll talk about that. It's, it's a fungus that came from Europe in 2006, and it is it, it's catastrophic, catastrophic for our bat populations. So scientists believe that the little brown bat will become extinct in 20 years, just 20 years, um, which is just devastating. And I honestly have to say that I probably will never handle another one in my life. They have a six and a half inch wingspan, they are so crazy, just like little Jack Russell Terriers. Really, where this guy's really laid back, these guys are wired. And they're so much fun. Um, and, and just, I mean, he's really fun too, but uh, these little guys are just such different personalities. All bats have very different personalities, just like different dog breeds have. Bat species have different personalities, and they're just charming animals. Um, so unfortunately, our little brown bat is all gone. The northern long-eared bat is very similar to our little brown bat, um, just like it actually, except it has long ears. And its uh, populations aren't as robust as the little brown bats once were here in Connecticut. And they're also going to be threatened with white nose syndrome. Interestingly enough, we're finding them kind of along the middle of the state, from Suffield down to the Talcott Ridge, uh, all the way into Southington. It seems that long-eared bats are kind of popping up here and there. But again, their populations are smaller, and they are being hurt by white nose syndrome. 1,200 mosquitoes in an hour is what the sample will eat. All the bats that you've just met are all crevice dwelling bats. It means these are all hibernators. The Indiana bat came into the uh, picture already federally endangered. This is one of the rarest species of bats in the United States. It is a native of Connecticut, and I believe only two of them have been found in the state in the past 50 years. They're very rare, very much like the little brown bat. And of course, the implications are, will this animal become extinct because of white nose syndrome? It's hard to find populations of them because they are extremely rare, but they would be very vulnerable. And then the last of our hibernating bats is the tricolored bat, our smallest bat also. He's got about a five and a half inch wingspan, and you can almost see why they call him tricolored. He's almost like a calico cat. And uh, again, a fairly rare species. And uh, this was the latest um, species of small bat that um, the biologists realized was being hurt by white nose syndrome. And they're fairly rare, and I assume that their populations are going to lose as well. So we have the hibernating bats in our state, but we also have uh, migrating bat species, and bat species that live only in trees. So the next three superstars are going to be all tree dwellers. The silver-haired bat must live in trees, and the red bat must live in trees, the hoary bat must live in trees. And as a result of habitat destruction, all three of these species are state-threatened. Um, the good news is that they're not being harmed by white nose syndrome. And scientists believe it's because when they migrate south for the winter, they're actually going into hibernation, but they're hibernating in the front of caves. Where the fungus exists is deep in caves where it's very cold. So, so far, so good for these animals because they don't need to be harmed any more than they already are. They can't adapt to a bathhouse or a, you know, the, they must live in a tree. And they don't um, live in colonies the way the other bat species do. These animals are solitary, they give birth to their young in a tree. Um, they, don't, they don't have big colonies the way some of the crevice or most of the crevice or all the crevice dwelling bats do. I like to put this up because it shows a picture of a silver bat the way it should be photographed. 
and one the way it should be photographed. So many of the field guides that I see in the stores with photographs of bats have them in a gaping picture like that. What does that picture tell you? We look at that and what do you think? Aggression. Exactly, aggression. All he's doing is using sonar in that photograph. He's checking out the photographer. <laughs> photographer needs a flash to get his picture, but he can see something as fine as one human hair with sonar. So the pictures that are portrayed of bats like this are just wrong, 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 wrong. Bats are laid back animals, and this beautiful picture on the right is what a bat should be, how a bat should be photographed. Um, and if you blur your eyes, you can see why they call this a silver-haired bat, how beautifully he would blend onto the bark of trays. Very, very difficult to see him. Um, he's about the size of our big brown bat. The eastern red bat is also um, state-threatened, must live in maple trees. Very, very particular about where it lives. And it's one of the few species of bats where we can actually tell the males from the females. The male is on the left, brighter orange color, and the female is more of a rusty, um, rusty uh, red color. Uh, again, um, just an absolutely spectacular animal. Seems like we're finding quite a few of them now in the southern portion of the state. And even sometimes in the winter, they're being raped up um, in piles of leaves. You know, the snow melts, and you want to go out and do a little early yard cleaning. And sometimes they're raking up red bats that are just hunkered down in piles of leaves, which is very strange. So again, there's not a lot known about these animals. They're all very, very rare. And then the hoary bat is our largest bat. It has a 14-inch wingspan. It's one of the most spectacular species of bats anywhere. It doesn't matter whether it's Connecticut or anywhere in the world. 14-inch um, wingspan, it flies fast. It flies in a straight line. Uh, and sometimes if it's flying over you, and it's rarely that you're going to see one. I think I've handled them maybe only three times in 20 years. Um, you, and that's three times more than what most biologists have done in my day. I've been very fortunate. Uh, you can actually hear some of their lower range of sonar as they're passing over you. If you've been to the Hawaiian Islands, the picture on the left is a subspecies of our hoary bat called the Hawaiian hoary bat. This is the only land mammal native to the Hawaiian Islands. So I think that's a really cool factoid about them. And again, um, a migratory species. So I picked out some of the funniest faces to show you, especially the second one down, that poor thing. What well, kind of cool show. It's so adorable. It's like a little gremlin. He's so cute. Where do bats live? What's their lifespan? What is their birth rate? What are the smallest and the largest? Where do they come from? They have to be descended from something. Are they blind? What about this rabies? Did they invent it? What about this white nose syndrome thing? Is it going to hurt my family? And what can bats do for me because I'm a conceited, self-indulgent human who thinks everything on this planet is here to serve me? Um, but better yet, what can I do for bats? Well, bats live everywhere but the coldest areas and the very hottest areas because they need to drink water, so you're never going to find them in Death Valley. You'll never find them in the Sahara or at the top of uh, Chile in the beautiful Atacama Desert. I'd love to go to one of these days, the Gobi Desert over in Mongolia. I'd love to go there, too. Um, oh, so many places. Not enough time, life, or money. Um, and, but you will find them anywhere else. You won't find them in the polar areas. Not in my favorite place, Iceland. What a shame. Uh, you know, they're city slickers and they're country bumpkins. Uh, so again, if you are a person that lives in downtown Hartford, if you are a person that lives in Paris, in London, in Budapest, um, uh, New York City, Boston, you can enjoy bats as much as we can in a, a rural area or a suburban area. Because wherever there are bodies of water, and all great cities have bodies of water, it's all about interstate commerce, about, um, boats coming up and down rivers and you know, bringing stuff. Um, so London has the Thames, and Budapest has the Danube, and Paris has the Seine. And these are all breeding grounds for insects. And wherever there are insects, you'll find bats. So uh, I'm going to Amsterdam tomorrow, and I've never scoped out bats in Amsterdam. And I hope it's not too late. I can't wait to see what. It's just a city of canals. It's got to be great bat watching there. So I might bring my sonar detector with me, <laughs> my play toy. Um, but yeah, you can, you can do great bat watching anywhere. And I just love this animal because it doesn't discriminate. If you're a child, an inner city child, you can appreciate and enjoy this animal as much as we can. It's really great. They can live for a very long time. So you just start thinking right now what they're related to. So mice and rats have short lives, very short lives. And bats have very long lives. A big brown bat, 19 years. Um, my friend Sue Barnard has a big brown bat that's 20, about 25 years old now. Uh, this red-headed flying fox, 23 years old. And the one that is most amazing is the Brant's myotis from Russia. 41 years old. They know it was 41 because it had a band on it, a biologist banded it 41 years before. So that's, and look at the hand. Look how tiny he is. 41 years old, that tiny little thing. Mm, definitely not a rodent. Uh, they have a very low birth rate. 
Bat pups, um, bat moms give birth to just one baby a year, called a pup. A bat mom will spend about an hour with its pup when it's first born, learning its scent and its high frequency voice. And colonies that, uh, they don't build nests, remember I told you they're lazy. They don't build nests, they colonize. They just live in big masses in barns or in maybe even bat houses or in caves or mines. And uh, they just hang out together and the mother bat can identify her pup just based on scent and sonar. So for the first four, well, a, if a pup is one third its mother's body weight when it's born. So you, know, you weighed 100 pounds the day your kid was born, your kid was a 33 pound baby. The good news for the mother is that your child was out of the house in four weeks. Just four weeks, that pup is all grown up. You know, the heart has been broken, the car has been crashed, the prom dress has been ripped, all these terrible things have happened, and uh, yet it's out on its own. So it may spend the summer in the colony with the mother, but it's on its own. So bad pups, especially in Connecticut, are born in a very advanced state. It's just four weeks from the time they're born to the time they fly and care for themselves. For the first two weeks of their lives, they attach to their mother's underside with teeth and claws, and the mother will take them out and on hunting trips and um, teach them everything that they need to live to survive. They, they will learn about um, uh, how to use their sonar, they'll learn about flight, they'll learn about everything. And after two weeks, when the pup is too heavy to carry, mom leaves it behind in a colony with all of the others. And again, she goes and hunts at night, and she comes back and feeds only her baby. So if mother is eaten by a hawk when she leaves the cave at night, um, then nobody's going to come to rescue her pup. The pup will, will starve and, and will die. So we do have some um, special bats here. This is a big brown bat. This is what I would be handling every year. Um, over here is an epileptic fruit bat from Africa with her big pups. So it's a larger species of, again, a fruit bat with the big eyes. And these animals are primary seed dispersers for fig trees. How could you ever hate a vampire when you look at that face? Mm -hmm. Do you know we have a, a colony of vampire bats now in, at the Jersey Zoo in Bridgeport? So you can go down and visit the vampires at Jersey Zoo. They're doing very, very well. I haven't visited them yet, but one of these days I'll get down there. So that's a little white-sided vampire fire bat. Um, Gray-headed flying foxes from Australia. These are all orphans. Their mothers died in floods that happened in Australia just a couple of years ago. They're just terrible floods. So these are all the orphan um, gray-headed flying foxes. And this is, a, again, in the center of a big brown bat with her very large pup. And um, the soap, that pup can't take care of itself. I'd say that pup is probably about two or three weeks old. So another week and that pup will be on its own really fast. How does she feed them? Uh, they have breasts and they just cling to their underside and they just nurse. They nurse. So until they're on their own and uh, hunt mm -hmm. their own? Until the, so there's no regurgitating of food like that's birds or anything like that. Yep. Um, they're, they're just milk fed. So, and, that's, and of course that's what's interesting as a rehabilitator. Um, when I'm weaning a bat pup onto solid food, I wonder how that happens in a colony. I've seen bat pups fledge for the first time in a green barn at White Memorial. It's just amazing. They, oh my God, it's so funny to watch them fly for the first time. But they, they go out with their mothers and they're watching their mothers do everything. They're nursing and I think it's just they're learning from her what they're going to be doing when they fly for the first time. I'm giving them a milk formula and I'm weaning them onto the guts of mealworms and then after four weeks they're knowing that they go to a dish and they help themselves to a mealworm. So it's it's kind of interesting um, to know that they're nursing and then all of a sudden bang, one day you're on, you're on solid food for the first time. The largest concentration of warm-blooded animals anywhere in the world is this cave called Bracken Cave. It's outside San Antonio, Texas. And it's now owned by Bat Conservation International, and they're actually opening up a big study center so that each and every one of us one day, soon hopefully, will be able to go to Brack and Cave and sit for three and a half hours and count the 50 million bats that are coming out of that cave every night. Because it takes three and a half hours for them to exit the cave. Um, they eat 250 tons of insects every summer night. This one cave of bats in this one little place on our planet eats 12 Asian elephants worth of insects every summer night. And the species of bat, the Mexican free tail, is about the size of our big brown. It flies at about 60 miles per hour, and it's been seen hunting at altitudes of 10,000 feet. Really amazing. And the same goes in this cave. The mother bat spends the hour with her pup. It learns its scent. It learns its voice, its high-frequency voice. It takes it out hunting at night, and at two weeks, it leaves the pup back in the colony. And when the mother bat returns in that mass of animals, she returns only to her baby to feed it.
This is a Mother's Day, every day at Brown and Cave. It's really, really incredible. The smallest bat is just the size of a penny. It's called the bumblebee bat. Um, the real name for it is the kitty's hog nose bat, and it's from Thailand. It is threatened with extinction because of habitat destruction. Very tiny little thing, and it eats insects. And then the largest bat is the Indonesian fruit bat, the Indonesian flying fox, and it has a wingspan of six feet. It has a wingspan of six feet and a body length of about two feet, and it's considered a delicacy in Indonesia. So these animals are being eaten faster than they can reproduce. They weigh only two pounds to begin with, um, and they're considered a festive food. And if you look really closely at the guy, in the, the man in the flying suit up here, um, look at his uh, pants. I'm swearing. <laughs> but look at their arms. They have, no, they have no meat on that. That's just skin. You can't do anything with that. Um, their arms have very few muscles. Uh, most of the muscles are relegated to the chest area. The legs, look at the legs on the right. He has no muscle on his legs. There's nothing but ligament uh, there. Why does he have no muscle? What's going on with this guy? Well, he's a flying mammal. He's a flying mammal. And muscle weighs a lot. And in order for him to fly, he can't be weighed down with unnecessary fat and muscle and other stuff that makes you heavy because he's a super special mammal that can fly. So as a result, he begins with only two pounds and if people are eating them and they have such a low birth rate of just one baby a year, people are eating them faster than they can reproduce. They say you are what you eat and this is a fruit eater and they eat very ripe fruit so their flesh must be very, very sweet. So what are they descended from? Do we have any idea? They're of the order Chiroptera. That's a Latin word that means hand wing. They're the only feline mammal, and evolutionists believe, of course, or assume that bats came from something. We know that horses came from a little tiny thing called the Eohippus that had five toes, and they got big and they became horses. I simplify it, but and the same thing with us. Evolutionists believe that they came from a non-flying mammal, but there isn't one shred of evidence in the fossil record that a bat came from anything, because it seemed to appear 40 to 50 million years ago exactly the way it looks today. It hasn't changed a bit. It was perfect then, it was perfect now, and it, it hasn't had to change. With that delicate skin skeleton and um, those wing membranes that tear so easily, it didn't have to be improved upon. They shared the daytime sky uh, 50 million years ago with birds, and uh, what happened was that there was just so much competition for food that over millions of years this animal developed into a nocturnal animal, showing you once again how smart he was, uh, because he was outnumbered big time um, 40 million years ago. You mentioned, excuse me, you mentioned that the, you know, that so, the membrane is so thin that would tear easily. How do they, if, I mean, you'd think that would happen all the time. That all the time it happens. Torn and torn Amazing. How does it heal? So quickly. It's incredible. It is absolutely incredible how quickly it heals. Um, it's, it's just such a resilient membrane. Really, really amazing. So you, I've had bats that have come in with just shredded, shredded wings, and almost in no time, they're completely healed, off you go. You don't but have to do much to it? <laughs> no, add vitamin E, make sure that when they heal, they heal so that you know the, the fingers can be stretched out completely. One of the problems that I had with one animal is that when it healed, it healed and the fingers were too close together. So we had to start just massaging uh, you know, mineral oil and vitamin E and let the membrane open up a little bit more and then we're able to let, to let the back go. Um, so they're not rodents. They, they give birth once a year. Rodents give birth to litters of babies during the course of the year. A rodent has a short lifespan. A bat has a very long lifespan. We know they're not birds because they're mammals. A bird has feathers. A bat has fur. Birds lay eggs. Bats give birth to, birth to live babies. Um, marsupial? <clears throat> no, they don't have a pouch. And this is a sugar glider, and he only glides. He doesn't truly fly like a bat. Uh, and then, how about a primate? Could it be related to us? Hmm. 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 We have to look inside and kind of think about your skeleton and think about a bat skeleton. Sure, your hand looks very different from his, but he has five fingers just like you. And if you were to take him to the manicurist down the road, mm -hmm. give him a little trim, shorten up his radius and ulna, Move the thumb down a little bit. You've got a perfect human hand. Um, his leg bones, except for this little spur that's coming out of the ankle there, are the same as ours. His, his kneecaps are put on backwards. The hips are, are very much like ours, except they're much narrower. And I think a real dead ringer is the entire chest area and the, and the skull. 
of the balance of the skull to the rest of the body. The brain-to-body ratio in a bat is exactly the same as a human's brain-to-body ratio. It's a very large brain. It's a very smart animal, um, a very long-living, low-reproducing, more closely related to a primate than it is to anything, except for the one thing that it can do that we can't do, unless we cheat. Why? And that's why um, Mr. Linnaeus has put them in an order all along called Chiroptera. There's nobody else in the order Chiroptera, only bats. How do they fly? Well, they certainly don't go on the ground, that's for sure. If a bat is on the ground, chances are it's, it could be sick, but chances are it's not sick at all. It just needs to crawl up something and drop and ascend. Um, bats, as you can see from this little brown bat, where's the muscle in his legs? Where's he going to power himself off the ground by muscle? He doesn't have it. So what he has to do is climb and drop and begin his ascent. So if you have a bat house, you need to put the bat house up very, very high because he knows if he's dropping three feet, four feet, or six feet out of that bat house and there's a cat or you on the ground down below, the higher the bat house, the more of a success rate you're apt to have by putting the bat house that way. Um, so they swim through the air. So we just wrapped up the Olympics a couple of months ago, and everybody was marveling at Michael Phelps and his butterfly stroke. And if you take the butterfly stroke, or you know how to do it, or you remember watching him do it, those are the exact same arm motions that a bat uses in flight. So they don't flap as the bird does. They actually swim through the air, pushing air up and forward. Um, there are a couple of rebels always and rule breakers. The vampire bat is one. It's one of the few species that can fly off the ground. And the pallet bat that eats scorpions also can fly off the ground. Uh, and when they drink, they drink while they're flying. So they'll skim over the surface of a swimming pool or a river or a stream, a, a pond, a lake. And they'll either drink water, um, open their mouths and drink as they're flying over, or they'll get water on their bellies and they'll lap it off and get the water that way. So if they don't have that muscle, how do they get off the ground? Uh, they're, well, how they're getting off the ground? They don't get off the ground. What they have to do is they have to crawl. They crawl over. I thought you said those two species. Oh, those two species are much are much more muscled than uh, than the others. Yeah, they're different, very different, and they're not blind. Uh, again, the um, fruit bats have large eyes. This is a tube-nosed bat, and then the ghost face bat is a micro bat with very small eyes. Black and white perception, color perception, but this guy does this. Uses sonar to navigate and find food. Does anybody know what other two mammals that live in the ocean? Um, what the two are that use sonar to navigate and find food? What are they? Dolphins. No. Dolphins and whales. And dolphins and whales. Dolphins, whales, and bats. Here's, here's the um, life lesson that I especially teach to young children. Uh, whales and dolphins, we just love them unconditionally. Let's face it, they're absolutely gorgeous animals. Um, we've been stumping for them for a very long time. Uh, we create movies, Hollywood uh, you know, puts them on a pedestal, Free Willy, um, TV shows, Flipper. Um, we go on whale watches, we go down to Mystic to see the captive breeding program uh, for beluga whales. We're very intrigued by these animals, we care deeply about them. They use sonar to navigate and find food, and then you get to this guy. Eats a thousand mosquitoes in an hour on a summer night. He's responsible for foods that you eat every single day, and you don't even have a clue yet about that. We'll talk about that. Um, even a vampire's saliva can save your life. And this animal gives and gives and gives and gives and gives, and it gets no respect. None. And why is that? It's spooky. It's spooky. It's spooky. <laughs> I'm ugly. I'm sorry. I'm ugly, and you don't like me because you don't understand me. And you know the the message is <clears throat> the message is obviously multifaceted um, with this animal, and, and especially when I'm teaching young children, that, you know, they, judging something based on the way it, it looks isn't cool. It's not right. And whether you're looking at the kid sitting next to you or an animal that looks a little bit different, learn learn about learn about this, this creature's worth before you judge it. Um, because honestly, the world sadly could exist without whales and dolphins, as extraordinary as they are, and I love them deeply, but the world cannot survive without the contributions bats make. So the kid that's sitting next to you that looks a little bit strange um, to you could be the person that grows up and, and, and cures cancer. I, you know, just don't judge based on looks. Uh, I look at these faces and I see just nothing but great beauty and uh, a lot of fewer insects in the world because of them. So this is a beautiful illustration of a silver bat. <clears throat> 
pulsing using the yellow is the sonar coming out of its mouth. Remember, it's high frequency sounds that we can't hear. And those sounds are echoing out, bouncing off of um, a moth and echoing back to the bat, those are the blue or the purple line or whatever you want to call that color. And the bat is receiving a picture painted in sound of everything around it, including that moth. And it just locks its sonar on it and begins to track it. And it's just a matter of when does the bat catch up with the moth. So if you're watching bats at night, they're such an unpredictable flyers. They're all over the place. A lot of people think they're being swept down the pond and uh, you know, bats are trying to get in their hair or something like that. Um, you know, I always say don't flatter yourself. This animal, again, needs to be 1,006 in an hour on a summer night. It doesn't care about your bouffant. It doesn't care about the campfire. It cares about nothing other than eating. He has one job on this planet. My job. What do you do for a living? I eat. I eat. That's what I do. I eat. Just leave me alone. I just eat. That's all I do. Only I'm a lover. I just eat. Um, they're lazy, and if you have an umbrella at your swimming pool and a floodlight there, um, that floodlight is hometown buffet for a bat. He's got the umbrella to stay under. He's got the water source for a drink, and he's going to just feed crazily at your beautiful uh, floodlight that is attracting all of those insects. So um, very, very powerful stuff with sonar, and we've only become interested in bats because of wartime. Uh, if you think about 60 or 70 years ago, that was you know, around World War II-ish or so, and that's when um, we became interested in these animals because of sonar. We can use them in wartime. Ah, now I'm interested. But only seriously studying bats for a, a few decades, really. Uh, what's really cool about sonar and bats, one of the other great factoids about it, is just as we identify birds by their calls, we identify 800 species of echolocating bats by their sonar voices. So just like birds you can identify, you'll hear Baldini at the end of the program, I'll take her out and force her to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk about rabies because a bat is a mammal and it can get rabies and it can give rabies, but it did not invent rabies. Rabies is a canine virus. Um, it's very prevalent, especially in places like India. Rabid dogs are running around everywhere. And when it arrived in the United States, it was also a canine virus. But we've been so proactive about inoculating our pets for rabies that um, it's not really something that dogs get very often now. It's something that's kind of drish, dribbled into the wildlife population. Um, the sad statistic of rabies and bats is that 100% of people who have died of rabies in our country in the last 50 years have died of a strain of bat rabies. But you need to educate yourself about rabies and then educate yourself about bats because one half of 1% of bats gets rabies. That's really super low. Uh, the skunk, the fox, and the raccoon, they're the really dangerous animals. Now, I work with mammals, so I get pre-exposure shots for the rabies virus. It's not because I work with a bat that I get the shot. I work with a mammal. My sister works in a uh, kennel at a, um, at a veterinary clinic, and she gets the same shots I do. Because more people come in contact with rabid cats and dogs every year than they do rabid wildlife. The most important thing you can do to protect your family from rabies is inoculating your pet and keeping your hands off wildlife. It's as simple as that. And what about rabies? There is only one person in the world that has survived after the symptoms of rabies started showing up and you're looking at her. This is the luckiest girl in the world. Um, and I really go on YouTube and Google her name or put on YouTube her name, Gianna, G-A-C, and hear her story. It was phenomenal what doctors did to save her life. Um, Jeff, she's probably 18 years old, and I think that she's completely recovered, but it took forever. She's a very active young lady that um, rides horses, barrel races, carriage drives, and, um, and she had bat rabies, and she actually survived. The fungus that is out to here, it's like a big piece of cotton candy stuffed on their face. This one's terrible, they can't breathe, they itch, they scratch. And when they leave the cave, the fungus disappears, you can't see it. But white nose syndrome, then what it will do is it just, it literally eats flesh, and it turns um, a lot of their, their wing membrane to paper. And it's just terrible. It's, I handled a, a, a bat with white nose syndrome, 2009 for several months, and what that poor little guy went through was just awful. Uh, in the beginning, um, uh, the wings will look like the top picture. You'll see little white dots, and that's the indication that there's something bad going on. The second picture, the end of the wing has just turned to nothing. It's all paper, basically. Um, then there's healthy tissue at the black arrow, and then the white tissue is infected as well. And the bottom is when it spreads all over the wing member, and that's what the, uh, the magenta, if you want to call it that, indicates. So what can bats do for me? Because this is what I'm waiting for. Tell me, Jerry. <laughs> Tell me, Jerry. Why should I love bats? 
why they're dirty, they're dangerous, they get caught in my hair, they have rabies, and they're ugly, and I don't like them, and they're probably filthy, and what's this white house center is going to make me sick. Well, if you ate dates, if you like dates, or if you like figs, fresh or in your fig newton cookie, or if you like cashew nuts, fresh mangoes, fresh bananas, um, and if you have a friend, because I don't think anybody here would do such a thing, drink this evil tequila. Um, if you have a friend over the age of 21 that enjoys this alcoholic beverage, they wouldn't have a drop of tequila if it weren't for a bath. This fruit, the king durian, is from Southeast Asia, apparently very stinky. You sometimes see it in our markets here. It's very sweet if you can get by the scent of it, but it's completely 100% dependent upon bats for pollination. And then this is your reason why you have tequila. This hero, the lesser long-nosed bat, in this photograph he's pollinating a solar, um, an organ pie cactus. Uh, the flowers of these plants open only after dark, and there's only one pollinator. And uh, this animal is, um, its numbers are dropping, so that means that the plants that it's also pollinating, their numbers are dropping. So, no... Is it real hard to write that one? Yeah. <laughs> well, he gets a, a little sound if you have to lose it. She'll probably bite me, which sometimes she does. I'm very tolerant of it. I haven't been working with her that long. She is, so, she's young. She's only about um, five yeah, months old. It feels a lot better. I mean, this time last year, he was just... Uh -huh. Oh, I know. You're such a bad boy. So you're going to bite me. I'm home from school. Ouch, ouch, ouch. That hurts. That hurts. Biting hurts. And then what she does is after she her initial horror of being picked up, she falls asleep in my hand. And she'll sleep in my hand for a while, actually. So she's about five months old. But I've never I've never raised a chip raised her. She was this big. Just such a little ingrate <laughs> to bite me that way. And of course she goes right through these gloves, these are not, and then she's starting to fall asleep right now. She's purring. So after the initial horror, she's been hand raised, but she definitely has a bit of an attitude. Which is kind of funny. Oh, nice and warm there, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I thought there's your hand, you put it back. So they purr, and it's like a low frequency purr that I mean, it feels like I have a little masseuse in my hand. Um, and then if I were to put her up to my ear, I would hear a Mm -hmm. This really low hum, and this is the, uh, the the feel and the sound of a contented bat. But I've also have held um, wild bats that use that buzz also in short spurts when they're really angry. So there are definitely different ways of um, interpreting the what I'm feeling in my hand right now. And this now, despite the fact that she was very crabby just seconds ago. She's already asleep and purring like a kitten. She came to me from Ansonia. Um, she and another little male bat who didn't unfortunately make it, um, came out of a bat house, a really nice colony. And um, we left them out overnight. Hopefully their moms will come back and collect them because bat mothers are really, really good moms but her mother never showed up. As a result, hi. hi. As a result, she ended up with me. A woman, a very nice lady that owns the bat house um, is monitored by the Connecticut DEEP um, because she's got a really substantial colony in her um, in her little bat house, which is, you know, it's great, great success. And, Something that we are very interested in because bats, of course, are suffering now from a horrible fungus called white nose syndrome. So, um, look at your hand. Look at your hand. She's big when she spreads her wings, but she's very big when she spreads her wings. She's probably not going to wake up. She's full grown. She's full grown. She's about five months old. Five months smaller than the bats I remember. Uh, the bats in the zoo are probably bigger species. Yeah, this is yeah. a very common big brown bat. Very common in our state. I can try to wake her up a little bit, but I can also just let her sleep. This is the time of year when they really start hunkering down for the winter, and um, so she won't. Uh, she really won't do much, and I can. I can't wake her up, and I will during the course of the program. But uh, I, I just would prefer to let her do her own thing.
So it really is all about her, not about us. <laughs> What's her name? Her name is it's a very strange name. It's Baldini. Baldini. <laughs> uh, the reason I call her Baldini is uh, she's the first pup I've ever raised. I've been doing this for 20 years. She's the first pup I ever raised who didn't have any fur up to four weeks of age. She was completely bald. Oh, and it's the strangest thing. And she had no mites or anything on her. She was as clean as a whistle, and she really didn't start growing fur. They'd mature at four weeks. So it was very strange, and we just started jokingly calling her, my sister's going to call her Baldini, <laughs> and now of course she's fully furred, and she's Baldini. So, um. <laughs> Do you want to know what happened to Bugsy? Oh, still with us. Oh, good. Bugs, when I get a yes, when I get a when I get a uh, pup in that I hand when I hand raise a pup, yeah. I'll always use those flying at night. It's not a bird. It's a bat. <laughs> what can I do for bats? This is the important thing. We can put up bat houses. Very important. You can do what I do at White Memorial every year. We have a serenade for the bats on the lawn at the conservation center. This is our big green barn that has a. About 170 big brown bats that live in it now, and Robert Missouri comes up from New Haven and plays guitar for the bats as they come out of the barn, and the families count uh, the bats and we eat cupcakes and we just celebrate this absolutely extraordinary animal. So she's just not used to being handled that much, despite the fact that I've handled her for all of them except one week of her life. Mm. Um, she'd rather just be asleep. Mm. Yeah, she's different. They all have different personalities. Mm. Let's see how shiny her coat is. Oh. <laughs> it was very evident that I probably talked to you because Christopher told me about you. I had brought my son back when my son. So. And if you recognize the voice, she's been our travel, uh, travel yeah, traffic I, reporter. I do it all. <laughs> I can make, and I can make this display for you, too. <laughs> So I get up early in the morning, I report traffic on two radio stations, and then I go and work in wildlife conservation full time, and then I lecture, and I've got my travel company, and I'm busy. <laughs> my parole officer likes it that way. You served our poor man for I used to. I don't, I don't cook anymore. I don't have time. I don't have time. I think my poor husband probably cooks more than I do now. But something had to give. House cleaning and cooking definitely gave. So. <laughs> And she goes home, her cage is very large. And what does she do in the carrier? She goes back no, she'll go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. She'll probably gripe at me a little bit when I put her in here. I'm going to break a bit. Just don't bite me because that really doesn't feel good. Look at this rain. It's not you can see how strong their claws are. Let me see what's hanging up. She's just hanging by her toes right now. Oh my gosh. Just hanging by her toes. Because that's usually the way you see them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you show me that figure? Oh my! <laughs> I don't there think I go. can actually. She's oh, going in there now. Yeah. There you go. There, I promise I won't touch you again. Oh, jeez, crabby, crabby. Oh, I heard that. Yeah. Oh, crabby bat. <laughs> Somebody kept waking you up when you were. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's what I say to kids that during during daytime programs and kids are trying to tap. this like, hey, <laughs> what if I came into your bedroom at night, two in the morning, and knocked on your door and started shaking you and trying to keep you awake. How would you feel? Not too good. That's she just right. burrow herself in those towels yeah. in there? Uh -huh. like and then she goes home and she's got a big old cage that she lives in and she's got other towels that she hangs in and um, she's got a good life. Hmm. Well, Jerry, thanks for coming. Yes. Audrey, and thank you so much for having me. everybody. It's a monthly seminar, first Thursday of every month. So next month we have Where the Wild Things Are in Connecticut, mm -hmm. November 1st. Um, Mark Rudowitz, who is the Simsbury Animal Patrol Officer, will be here. He has run into, let's see, bears, fawns, rabbit skunks, coyotes, and many more. So he'll be here to tell us all about where those wild things are. <laughs> Hope you can make it. Jerry, thank you so much for coming. A pleasure as my, always. My pleasure. Thanks for having me again, Audrey. We've learned a lot. Thank Thanks. you. Love your bats. <laughs> yeah. They're not just for Halloween anymore. Why are the, the zoos not doing more with breeding programs? Uh, I think that unfortunately, that I, I think it's too late. I mean, yeah. this thing just, it just hits so fast mm -hmm. that you, it's not as though you can collect what's left mm -hmm. because then there's an inbreeding problem as yeah. well. Yeah. It's just, I don't know what they do. What do you do? What do you do about it? So, very, very sad. But, you can't just wash it off. No.